Section 16 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte, translated by John Henry Bridges. Section 16 chapter four the influence of positivism upon women part one in their action then upon society philosophers may hope for the energetic support of the working classes but the regenerating movement requires still the cooperation of a third element an element indicated by our analysis of human nature and suggested also by historical study of the great crisis of modern times the moral constitution of man consists of something more than intellect and activity these are represented in the constitution of society by the philosophic body and the proletariat but besides these there is feeling which in the theory put forward in the first chapter of this work was shown to be the predominating principle the motive power of our being the only basis on which the various parts of our nature can be brought into unity now the alliance between philosophers and working men which has been just described however perfectly it may be realized does not represent the element of feeling with sufficient distinctness and prominence certainly without social feeling neither philosophers nor proletaries can exercise any real influence but in their case its source is not sufficiently pure nor deep to sustain them in the performance of their duty a more spontaneous and more perennial spring of inspiration must be found with the philosopher social sympathies will never be wanting in coherence since they will be connected with his whole system of thought but this very scientific character will deaden their vigour unless they are revived by impulses in which reflection has no share roused as he will be by the consciousness of public duty to a degree of activity of which abstract thinkers can form no conception the emotions of private life will yet be not less necessary for him than for others intercourse with the working classes will be of the greatest benefit to him but even this is not enough to compensate the defects of a life devoted to speculation the sympathies of the people again though stronger and more spontaneous than those of the philosopher are in most cases less pure and not so lasting from the pressure of daily necessities it is difficult for them to maintain the same consistent and disinterested character great as are the moral advantages which will result from the incorporation of the people in modern society they are not enough by themselves to outweigh the force of self-interest aroused by the precarious nature of their position emotions of a gentler and less transient kind must be called into play philosophers may relieve the working classes from the necessity of pressing their own claims and grievances but the fact still remains that the instincts by which those claims are prompted are personal rather than social thus in the alliance which has been here proposed as necessary for social reorganization feeling the most influential part of human nature has not been adequately represented an element is wanting which shall have the same relation to the moral side of our constitution as the philosophic body has with intellect and the people with activity on this as well as on other grounds it is indispensable that women be associated in the work of regeneration as soon as its tendencies and conditions can be explained to them with the addition of this third element the constructive movement at last assumes its true character 
we may then feel confident that our intellectual and practical faculties will be kept in due subordination to universal love the digressions of intellect and the subversive tendencies of our active powers will be as far as possible prevented indispensable to positivism as the cooperation of women is it involves one essential condition modern progress must rise above its present imperfect character before women can thoroughly sympathize with it at present the general feeling amongst them is antipathy to the revolution they dislike the destructive character which the revolution necessarily exhibited in its first phase all their social sympathies are given to the middle ages and this is not merely due as is supposed to the regret which they very naturally feel for the decline of chivalry although they cannot but feel that the middle ages are the only period in which the feeling of reverence for women has been properly cultivated but the real ground of their predilection is deeper and less interested it is that being morally the purest portion of humanity they venerate catholicism as the only system which has upheld the principle of subordinating politics to morals this i cannot doubt is the secret cause of most of the regret with which women still regard the irrevocable decay of medieval society they do not disregard the progress which modern times have made in various special directions but our erroneous tendencies towards bringing back the old supremacy of politics over morality are in their eyes a retrograde movement so comprehensive in its character that no partial improvements can compensate for it true we are able to justify this deviation provisionally since the decay of catholicism renders political dictatorship necessary but women having comparatively little to do with the practical business of life can hardly appreciate this necessity without a more satisfactory theory of history than they at present possess it is a complete mistake to charge women with being retrograde on account of these feelings of regret which are most honourable to them they might retort the charge with far better reason on the revolutionists for their blind admiration of greek and roman society which they still persist in asserting to be superior to catholic feudalism a delusion the continuance of which is principally due to our absurd system of classical education from which women are fortunately preserved however this may be the feelings of women upon these subjects are a very plain and simple demonstration of the first condition of social regeneration which is that politics must again be subordinated to morality and this upon a more intelligible more comprehensive and more permanent basis than catholicism could supply a system which supplied such a basis would naturally involve reverence for women as one of its characteristic results such then are the terms on which women will cordially cooperate in the progressive movement nothing but incapacity to satisfy these terms could induce any thinkers to condemn the conception as retrograde it is not then to the revolution itself that women feel antipathy but to the anti-historic spirit which prevailed in its first phase the blind abuse lavished on the middle ages wounds their strongest sympathies they care little for metaphysical theories of society in which human happiness is made to consist in a continual exercise of political rights for political rights however attractively presented will always fail to interest them but they give their cordial sympathy to all reasonable claims of the people and these claims form the real object of the revolutionary crisis they will wish all success to philosophers and workmen when they see them endeavouring to transform political disputes into social compacts 
and proving that they have greater regard for duties than for rights if they regret the decline of the gentle influence which they possessed in former times it is principally because they find it superseded by coarse and egotistic feelings which are now no longer counterbalanced by revolutionary enthusiasm instead of blaming their antipathies we should learn from them the urgent necessity of putting an end to the moral and intellectual anarchy of our times for this it is which gives a ground of real justice to their reproaches women will gladly associate themselves with the revolution as soon as its work of reconstruction is fairly begun its negative phase must not be prolonged too far it is difficult enough for them to understand how such a phase could ever be necessary therefore they cannot be expected to excuse its aberrations the true connection of the revolution with the middle ages must be fairly stated history when rightly interpreted will show them that its real object is while laying down a surer basis of morality to restore it to the old position of superiority over politics in which the medieval system first placed it women will feel enthusiasm for the second phase of the revolution when they see republicanism in the light in which positivism presents it modified by the spirit of ancient chivalry then and not till then will the movement of social regeneration be fairly begun the movement can have no greater force until women give cordial support to it for it is they who are the best representatives of the fundamental principle on which positivism rests the victory of social over selfish affections on philosophers rests the duty of giving logical coherence to this principle and saving it from sophistical attacks its practical working depends upon the proletary class without whose aid it would almost always be evaded but to maintain it in all its purity as an inspiration that needs neither argument nor compulsion is the work of women only so constituted the alliance of the three classes will be the foreshadowed image of the normal state to which humanity is tending it will be the living type of perfect human nature unless the new philosophy can obtain the support of women the attempt to substitute it for theology in the regulation of social life had better be abandoned but if the theory stated in my first chapter be true positivism will have even greater influence with women than with the working classes in the principle which animates it in its manner of regarding and handling the great problem of human life it is but a systematic development of what women have always felt instinctively to them as to the people it offers a noble career of social usefulness and it holds out a sure prospect of improvement in their own personal positions nor is it surprising that the new philosophy should possess such qualities they follow naturally from the reality which is one of its chief claims to acceptance in other words from the exactness with which it takes account of the facts of every subject that it deals with strong as the prejudices of women are upon religious questions it cannot be long before they find out that positivism satisfies not merely their intellectual but their moral and social wants better than catholicism they will then have no further reason for clinging to the old system of the decayed condition of which they are perfectly aware at present they not unnaturally confound positivism with the scientific specialties on which it is based scientific studies has as they see a hardening influence which they cannot suppose that the new school of philosophers who insist so strongly upon the necessity of studying science can have escaped closer acquaintance with the subject will show them where their error lies 
they will see that the moral danger of scientific studies arises almost entirely from want of purpose and from irrational specialty which always alienate them from the social point of view but for the positivist this danger does not exist since however far he may carry these preliminary studies he does so simply in order to gain a stronger grasp of social questions his one object is to concentrate all the powers of man upon the general advancement of the race and so long as this object be kept in view women's good sense will readily distinguish between the training necessary for it and the puerilities of the learned societies the general spirit of this work however makes further explanation unnecessary the social mission of woman in the positive system follows as a natural consequence from the qualities peculiar to her nature in the most essential attribute of the human race the tendency to place social above personal feeling she is undoubtedly superior to man morally therefore and apart from all material considerations she merits always our loving veneration as the purest and simplest impersonation of humanity who can never be adequately represented in any masculine form but these qualities do not involve the possession of political power which some visionaries have claimed for women though without their own consent in that which is the great object of human life they are superior to men but in the various means of attaining that object they are undoubtedly inferior in all kinds of force whether physical intellectual or practical it is certain that man surpasses woman in accordance with a general law which prevails throughout the animal kingdom now practical life is necessarily governed by force rather than by affection because it requires unremitting and laborious activity if there were nothing else to do but to love as in the christian utopia of a future life in which there are no material wants women would be supreme but life is surrounded with difficulties which it needs all our thoughts and energies to avoid therefore man takes the command notwithstanding his inferiority in goodness success in all great efforts depends more upon energy and talent than upon good will although this last condition reacts strongly upon the others thus the three elements of our moral constitution do not act in perfect harmony force is naturally supreme and all that women can do is to modify it by affection justly conscious of their superiority in strength of feeling they endeavor to assert their influence in a way which is often attributed by superficial observers to the mere love of power but experience always teaches them that in a world where the simplest necessities of life are scarce and difficult to procure power must belong to the strongest not to the most affectionate even though the latter may deserve it best with all their efforts they can never do more than modify the harshness with which men exercise their authority and men submit more readily to their modifying influence from feeling that in the highest attributes of humanity women are their superiors they see that their own supremacy is due principally to the material necessities of life provision for which calls into play the self-regarding rather than the social instincts hence we find it the case in every phase of human society that women's life is essentially domestic public life being confined to men civilization so far from effacing this natural distinction tends as i shall afterwards show to develop it while remedying its abuses thus the social position of women is in this respect very similar to that of philosophers and of the working classes and we now see why these three elements should be united 
it is their combined action which constitutes the moral or modifying force of society philosophers are excluded from political power by the same fatality as women although they are apt to think that their intellectual eminence gives them a claim to it were our material wants more easily satisfied the influence of intellect would be less impeded than it is by the practical business of life but on this hypothesis women should have a better claim to govern than philosophers for the reasoning faculties would have remained almost inert had they not been needed to guide our energies the constitution of the brain not being such as to favor their spontaneous development whereas the effective principle is dependent on no such external stimulus for its activity a life of thought is a more evident disqualification for the government of the world even than a life of feeling although the pride of philosophers is a greater obstacle to submission than the vanity of women with all its pretensions intellectual force is not in itself more moral than material force each is but an instrument the merit depends entirely upon its right employment the only element of our nature which is in itself moral is love for love alone tends of itself towards the preponderance of social feeling over self-interest and since even love cannot govern what can be the claim of intellect in practical life precedence must always depend upon superior energy reason even more than feeling must be restricted to the task of modifying philosophers therefore must be excluded from government at least as rigidly as women it is in vain for intellect to attempt to command it never can do more than modify in fact the morality which it indirectly possesses is due to its impossibility of exercising compulsory power and would be ruined by the attainment of it supposing it were possible intellect may do much to amend the natural order of things provided that it does not attempt to subvert it what it can do is by its power of systematic arrangement to effect the union of all the classes who are likely to exert a beneficial influence on material power it is with this view that every spiritual power has availed itself of the aid of women as we see was the case in the middle ages proceeding with our sociological analysis of moral force we shall find an equally striking resemblance between the influence of women and that exercised by the people in the first stage of progress there is no modifying power except what springs from feeling afterwards intellect combines with it finding itself unable to govern the only element now wanting is activity and this want which is indispensable is supplied by the cooperation of the people the fact is that although the people constitute the basis on which all political power rests yet they have as little to do directly with the administration of power as philosophers or women power in the strict sense of the word power that is which controls action without persuading the will has two perfectly distinct sources numbers and wealth the force of numbers is usually considered the more material of the two but in reality it is the more moral being created by cooperation it involves some convergence of ideas and feelings and therefore it does not give such free scope for the self-regarding instincts as the more concentrated power of wealth but for this very reason it is too indirect and precarious for the ordinary purposes of government it can influence government morally but cannot take an active part in it the same causes which exclude philosophers and women apply in the case of the people our material necessities are so urgent that those who have the means of providing for them 
will always be the possessors of power now the wealthy have these means they hold in their hands the products of labor by which each generation facilitates the existence and prepares the operations of its successor consequently the power of the capitalist is one of so concentrated a kind that numbers can very seldom resist it successfully even in military nations we find the same thing the influence of numbers though more direct affects only the mode of acquiring wealth not its tenure but in industrial states where wealth is acquired by other ways than violence the law is evident and with the advance of civilization it will operate not less but more strongly capital is ever on the increase and consequently is ever creating means of subsistence for those who possess nothing in this sense but in no other the cynical maxim of antiquity possis nascitur humanum genus will always bear a true meaning the few provide subsistence for the many we come back then to the conclusion of the last chapter that the working classes are not destined for political power but that they tend to become a most important source of moral power the moral value of their influence is even more indirect than that of philosophers and depends even more in their case upon subordination politically in the few cases where government passes for a time into the hands of the masses wealth in its turn assumes a sort of moral influence foreign to its nature it moderates the violence with which government is apt to be administered in such cases the high intellectual and moral qualities belonging to the working classes are as we have seen in great part due to their social position they would be seriously impaired if the political authority that belongs to wealth were habitually transferred to numbers such in outline is the positive theory of moral force by it the despotism of material force may be in part controlled it rests upon the union of the three elements in society who are excluded from the sphere of politics strictly so called in their combined action lies our principal hope of solving so far as it can be solved the great problem of man's nature the successful struggle of social feeling against self-love each of the three elements supplies a quality indispensable to the task without women this controlling power would be deficient in purity and spontaneous impulse without philosophers in wisdom and coherence without the people in energy and activity the philosophic element although neither the most direct nor the most efficient is yet the distinctive feature of this power because its function is to organize its constitution and direct its operations in accordance with the true laws of social life as being the systematic organ of the spiritual power it has become identified with it in name this however may lead to an erroneous conception the moral aspect of the spiritual power is more important than the intellectual while retaining the name as an historical tradition of real value positivists attach a somewhat different meaning to it it originated in a time when theories of society were unknown and when intellect was considered as the central principle of human nature spiritual power as interpreted by positivism begins with the influence of women in the family it is afterwards moulded into a system by thinkers while the people are the guarantees for its political efficiency although it is the intellectual class that institutes the union yet its own part in it as it should never forget is less direct than that of women less practical than that of the people 
the thinker is socially powerless except so far as he is supported by feminine sympathy and popular energy thus the necessity of associating women in the movement of social regeneration creates no obstacle whatsoever to the philosophy by which that movement is to be directed on the contrary it aids its progress by showing the true character of the moral force which is destined to control all the other forces of man it involves as perfect an inauguration of the normal state as our times of transition admit for the chief characteristic of that state will be a more complete and more harmonious union of the same three classes to whom we are now looking for the first impulse of reform already we can see how perfectly adapted to the constitution of man this final condition of humanity will be feeling reason activity whether viewed separately or in combination correspond exactly to the three elements of the regenerative movement women philosophers and people verification of this theory may be found more or less distinctly in every period of history each of the three classes referred to have always borne out the biological law that the life of relation or animal life is subordinated to the life of nutrition still more striking is the application to this case of another general principle namely that progress is the development of order a principle which as i showed in the second chapter connects every dynamic question in sociology with the corresponding statical conception for with the growth of society the modifying influence of moral force is always increasing both by larger scope being given to each of its three elements specially and also by the more perfect consolidation of their union robertson has made an important remark on the gradual improvement in the condition of women which is but a particular case of this sociological law the general principle on which progress in all three classes depends is the biological law that the preponderance of vegetable life over animal life diminishes as the organism is higher in the scale and is more perfectly developed End of section 16. section 17 of a general view of positivism this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte Translated by John Henry Bridges Section 17 Chapter 4 The Influence of Positivism Upon Women Part 2 during the various phases of ancient polytheism the controlling power consisted simply of the moral influence exerted by women in the family in public life the influence of thinkers had not made itself independent of the governmental authority of which it was sometimes the source sometimes the instrument medieval catholicism went a step further and took the first step in systematizing moral force it created an independent spiritual authority to which political governments were subordinated and this authority was always supported by women but the complete organization of moral force was reserved for modern times it is only recently that the working classes have begun to interfere actively in social questions and as i have shown in the preceding chapter it is from their cooperation that the new spiritual power will derive its practical efficiency limited originally to the sphere of feeling and subsequently extended to the intellectual sphere 
it henceforward embraces the sphere of activity and this without losing its spiritual character since the influences of which it consists are entirely distinct from the domain of practical politics each of its three elements persuades advises judges but except in isolated cases never commands the social mission of positivism is to regulate and combine their spontaneous action by directing each to the objects for which it is best adopted and this mission in spite of strong prejudices to the contrary it will be found well calculated to fulfil i have already shown its adaptation to the case of the people and of the philosophic body whether regarded separately or in combination i have now to show that it is equally adapted to the case of women in proof of this i have but to refer to the principle on which as stated in the first chapter the whole system of positivism is based the preponderance of affection in our nature such a principle is of itself an appeal to women to associate themselves with the system as one of its essential elements in catholicism their cooperation though valuable was not of primary importance because catholicism claimed a divine origin independent of their assistance but to positivism they are indispensable as being the purest and simplest embodiment of its fundamental principle it is not merely in the family that their influence will be required their duty will often be to call philosophers and people back to that unity of purpose which originated in the first place with themselves and which each of the other elements is often disposed to violate all true philosophers will no doubt accept and be profoundly influenced by the conviction that in all subjects of thought the social point of view should be logically and scientifically preponderant they will consequently admit the truth that the heart takes precedence of the understanding still they require some more direct incentive to universal love than these convictions can supply knowing as they do how slight is the practical result of purely intellectual considerations they will welcome so precious an incentive were it only in the interest of their own mission i recognized its necessity myself when i wrote on the eleventh of march eighteen forty six to her who in spite of death will always remain my constant companion i was incomplete as a philosopher until the experience of deep and pure passion has given me fuller insight into the emotional side of human nature strong affection exercises a marvellous influence upon mental effort it elevates the intellect at once to the only point of view which is really universal doubtless the method of pure science leads up to it also but only by a long and toilsome process which exhausts the power of thought and leaves little energy for following out the new results to which this great principle gives rise the stimulation of affection under feminine influence is necessary therefore for the acceptance of positivism not merely in those classes for whom a long preliminary course of scientific study would be impossible it is equally necessary for the systematic teachers of positivism in whom it checks the tendency which is encouraged by habits of abstract speculation to deviate into useless digressions these being always easier to prosecute than researches of real value under this aspect the new spiritual system is obviously superior to the old by the institution of celibacy which was indispensable to catholicism its priests were entirely removed from the beneficial influence exercised by women only those could profit from it who did not belong to the ecclesiastical body the members of that body as ariosto has remarked in his vigorous satire were excluded 
nor could the evil be remedied except in very rare cases by irregular attachment which inevitably corrupted the priest's character by involving the necessity of perpetual hypocrisy and when we look at the difference of the spirit by which the two systems are pervaded we shall find still more striking evidence that the new system offers a far larger sphere of moral influence to women than the old both are based on the principle of affection but in positivism the affection inculcated is social in catholicism it is essentially personal the object of catholic devotion is one of such stupendous magnitude that feelings which are unconnected with it are in danger of being crushed the priesthood it is true wise interpreters in this respect of a general instinct brought all the more important social obligations within the compass of religion and held them out as necessary for salvation indirectly the nobler feelings were thus called into action and at the same time they were rendered far less spontaneous and pure there could be no perfectly disinterested affection under a system which promised eternal rewards for all acts of self-denial for it was impossible and indeed it would have been thought sinful to keep the future out of sight and thus all spontaneous generosity was unavoidably tainted by self-interest catholicism gave rise to an ignoble theory of morals which became very mischievous when it was adopted by the metaphysicians because while retaining the vicious principle they swept away the checks by which the priesthood had controlled it but even when we look at the purest form in which the love of god was exhibited we cannot call it a social feeling except in so far as the same object of worship was held out simultaneously to all intrinsically it is antisocial, since when attained in absolute perfection it implies the entire sacrifice of all other love and in the best representatives of christian thought and feeling this tendency is very apparent no one has portrayed the catholic ideal with such sublimity and pathos as the author of the imitation a work which so well deserved the beautiful translation of corneli and yet reading it as i do daily i cannot help remarking how grievously the natural nobleness of thomas a kempis was impaired by the catholic system although in spite of all obstacles he rises at times to the purest ardour certainly those of our feelings which are purely unselfish must be far stronger and more spontaneous than ever has yet been supposed since even the oppressive discipline of twelve centuries could not prevent their growth positivism from the fact of its conformity with the constitution of our nature is the only system calculated to develop both in public and in private life those high attributes of humanity which for want of adequate systematic culture are still in their rudimentary stages catholicism while appealing to the heart crushed intellect and intellect naturally struggled to throw off the yoke positivism on the contrary brings reason into complete harmony with feeling without impairing the activity of either scientific study of the relation which each individual bears to the whole race is a continual stimulus to social sympathy without a theory of society it is impossible to keep this relation distinctly and constantly in view it is only noticed in a few exceptional cases and unconnected impressions are soon effaced from the memory but the positivist teacher taking the social point of view invariably will make this notion far more familiar to us than it has ever been before he will show us the impossibility of understanding any individual or society apart from the whole life of the race 
nothing but the bewilderment caused by theological and metaphysical doctrines can account for the shallow explanations of human affairs given by our teachers attributing as they do to man what is really due to humanity but with the sounder theory that we now possess we can see the truth as it really stands we have but to look each of us to our own life under its physical intellectual or moral aspects to recognize what it is that we owe to the combined action of our predecessors and contemporaries the man who dares to think himself independent of others either in feelings thoughts or actions cannot even put the blasphemous conception into words without immediate self-contradiction since the very language he uses is not his own the profoundest thinker cannot by himself form the simplest language it requires the cooperation of a community for several generations without further illustration the tendency of positive doctrine is evident it appeals systematically to our social instincts by constantly impressing upon us that only the whole is real that the parts exist only in abstraction but independently of the beneficial influence which in this final state of humanity the mind will exercise upon the heart the direct culture of the heart itself will be more pure and more vigorous than under any former system it offers us the only means of disengaging our benevolent affections from all calculations of self-interest as far as the imperfection of man's nature admits these affections will gradually become supreme since they give deeper satisfaction than all others and are capable of fuller development setting the rewards and punishments of theology aside we shall attain at last to that which is the real happiness of man pure and disinterested love this is truly the sovereign good sought for so long by former systems of philosophy in vain that it surpasses all other good one fact will show known to the tender-hearted from personal experience that it is even better to love than to be loved overstrained as this may seem to many it is yet in harmony with a general truth that our nature is in a healthier state when active than when passive in the happiness of being loved there is always some tinge of self-love it is impossible not to feel pride in the love of one whom we prefer to all others since then loving gives purer satisfaction than being loved the superiority of perfectly disinterested affection is at once demonstrated it is the fundamental defect of our nature that intrinsically these affections are far weaker than the selfish propensities connected with the preservation of our own existence but when they have been once aroused even though the original stimulus may have been personal they have greater capacity of growth owing to the peculiar charm inherent in them besides in the exercise of these feelings all of us can cooperate with and encourage one another whereas the reverse is the case with the selfish instincts there is therefore nothing unreasonable in supposing that positivism by regulating and combining these natural tendencies may rouse our sympathetic instincts to a condition of permanent activity hitherto unknown when the heart is no longer crushed by theological dogmas or hardened by metaphysical theories we soon discover that real happiness whether public or private consists in the highest possible development of the social instincts self-love comes to be regarded as an incurable infirmity which is to be yielded to only so far as is absolutely necessary here lies the universal adaptability of positivism to every type of character and to all circumstances in the humblest relations of life 
as in the highest regenerate humanity will apply the obvious truth it is better to give than to receive the heart thus aroused will in its turn react beneficially upon the intellect and it is especially from women that this reaction will proceed i have spoken of it so fully before that i need not describe it further it is in feeling that i find the basis on which the whole structure of positivism intellectually as well as morally considered rests the only remark i have now to add is that by following out this principle philosophical difficulties of the most formidable kind are at once surmounted from moral considerations the intellect may be readily induced to submit to scientific restrictions the propriety of which would remain for a long time matter of debate were philosophical discussions the only means of indicating it attempt for instance to convince a pure mathematician however conscientious and talented that sociology is both logically and scientifically superior to all other studies he would not readily admit this and severe exertion of the inductive and deductive faculties can alone convince him of it but by the aid of feeling an artisan or a woman can without education readily grasp this great encyclopedic principle and apply it practically to the common affairs of life but for this the largest conceptions of philosophy would have but a limited range and very few would be capable of the course of study which is yet so important on social grounds for all comprehensiveness of mind is no doubt favourable to sympathy but is itself more actively stimulated by it when the positivist method of education is accepted moral excellence will be very generally regarded as a guarantee of real intellectual capacity the revolutionist leaders of the convention showed their sense of this connection by allowing as they did sometimes republican ardor to outweigh scientific attainment of course so long as men remain without a systematic theory of morals such policy would be likely to fail of its object and indeed would become positively mischievous but the reproach is usually that it was a retrograde policy a reproach far more applicable to the present system in which the standard of fitness for any office is regulated exclusively by intellectual considerations the heart being altogether disregarded historically we can explain this practice by the fact that the religious faith in which our moral nature has hitherto been trained has been of a most oppressive character ever since the middle ages the intellect and the heart have been unavoidably at issue positivism is the only system which can put an end to their antagonism because as i have before explained while subordinating reason to feeling it does so in such a way as not to impair the development of either with its present untenable claims to supremacy intellect is in reality the principal source of social discord until it abdicates in favor of the heart it can never be of real service in reconstruction but its abdication will be useless unless it is entirely voluntary now this is precisely the result which positivism attains because it takes up the very ground on which the claims of intellect are defended namely scientific demonstration a ground which the defenders of intellect cannot repudiate without suspicion at once attaching to their motives but theological or metaphysical remedies can only exasperate the disease by oppressing the intellect they provoke it to fresh insurrection against the heart for all these reasons women who are better judges of moral questions than ourselves 
will admit that positivism incontestably superior as it is to other systems intellectually surpasses them yet more in dealing with the affections their only objection arises from confounding positive philosophy itself with its preliminary course of scientific study women's minds no doubt are less capable than ours of generalizing very widely or of carrying on long processes of deduction they are that is less capable than men of abstract intellectual exertion on the other hand they are generally more alive to that combination of reality with utility which is one of the characteristics of positive speculation in this respect they have much in common intellectually with the working classes and fortunately they have also the same advantage of being untrammelled by the present absurd system of education nor is their position far removed from what it should be normally being less engaged than men in the business of life their contemplative faculties are called into activity more easily their minds are neither preoccupied nor indifferent the most favorable condition for the reception of philosophical truth they have far more affinity intellectually with philosophers who truly deserve the name than we find in the scientific men of the present day comprehensiveness of thought they consider as important as positivity whereas our savants care for nothing but the latter quality and even that they understand imperfectly moliere's remarkable expression de clartes de tout which i applied in the last chapter to popular education was used by him in reference to women accordingly we find that women took a vivid interest in the very first attempt made to systematize positive speculation the cartesian philosophy no more striking proof could be given of their philosophical affinities and the more so that in the cartesian system moral and social speculations are necessarily excluded surely then we may expect them to receive positivism far more favorably a system of which the principal subject of speculation is the moral problem in which both sexes are alike interested women therefore may like the people be counted among the future supporters of the new philosophy without their combined aid it could never hope to surmount the strong repugnance to it which is felt by our cultivated classes especially in france where the question of its success has first to be decided but when women have sufficient acquaintance with positivism to see its superiority to catholicism in questions of feeling they will support it from moral sympathy even more than from intellectual adhesion it will be the heart even more than the mind which will incline them to the only system of philosophy which has fully recognized the preponderance of feeling they cannot fail to be drawn towards a system which regards women as the embodiment of this principle the unity of human nature of which this principle is the basis being thus entrusted to their special charge the only reason of their regret for the past is that the present fails to satisfy their noblest social instincts not that catholicism ever really satisfied them indeed in its general character it is even less adapted to women than to men since the dominant quality of women's nature is in direct contradiction with it christianity notwithstanding its claim to moral perfection has always confounded the quality of tenderness with that of purity and it is true that love cannot be deep unless it is also pure but catholicism although it purified love from the animal propensities which had been stimulated by polytheism did nothing otherwise to strengthen it it has given us indeed too many instances of purity 
pushed to the extent of fanaticism without tenderness and this result is especially common now because the austerity of the christian spirit is not corrected as it used to be by the inspiring influences of chivalry polytheism deficient as it was in purity was really far more conducive than christianity to tenderness love of god the supreme affection round which catholicism endeavored to concentrate all other feelings was essentially a self-regarding principle and as such conflicted with woman's noblest instincts not only did it encourage monastic isolation but if developed to the full extent it became inconsistent with love for our fellow-men it was impiety for the knight to love his lady better than his god and thus the best feelings of his nature were repressed by his religious faith women therefore are not really interested in perpetuating the old system and the very instincts by which their nature is characterized will soon incline them to abandon it they have only been waiting until social life should assume a less material character so that morality for the preservation of which they justly consider themselves responsible may not be compromised and on this head positivism satisfies their heart no less than their understanding with all the guarantees that they can require based as it is upon accurate knowledge of our nature it can combine the simple affectionate spirit of polytheism with the exquisite purity of catholicism without fear of taint from the subversive sophisms engendered by the spiritual anarchy of our times not however that purity is to be placed on the same level with tenderness tenderness is the more essential of the two qualities because more closely connected with the grand object of all human effort the elevation of social feeling over self-love in a woman without tenderness there is something even more monstrous than in a man without courage whatever her talents and even her energy may be they will in most cases prove mischievous both to herself and to others unless indeed they should be nullified by the restraint of theological discipline if she has force of character it will be wasted in a struggle against all legitimate authority while her mental power will be employed only in destructive sophisms too many cases of this kind present themselves in the social anarchy of the present time End of section 17. Section 18 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Section 18. Chapter 4. The Influence of Positivism Upon Women. Part 3 such is the positivist theory on the subject of women it marks out for them a noble field of social usefulness it extends the scope of their influence to public as well as private life and yet in a way thoroughly in harmony with their nature without leaving the family they will participate in the controlling power exercised by philosophers and workmen seeking even in their own domestic sphere rather to modify than to govern in a word as i shall show more fully in the last chapter of this introductory work woman is the spontaneous priestess of humanity she personifies in the purest form the principle of love upon which the unity of our nature depends and the culture of that principle in others is her special function all classes therefore must be brought under women's influence for all require to be reminded constantly of the great truth that reason and activity are subordinate to feeling of their influence upon philosophers i have spoken 
if they are men worthy of their mission they will be conscious of the tendency which their life has to harden them and lead them into useless speculation and they will feel the need of renewing the ardor of their social sympathy at its native source feeling when it is pure and deep corrects its own errors because they clash with the good to which it is ever tending but erroneous use of the intellect or practical faculties cannot be even recognized much less corrected without the aid of affection which is the only part of our nature that suffers directly from such errors therefore whenever either the philosopher or the people deviate from their duty it will be the part of women to remonstrate with them gently and recall them to the true social principles which are entrusted to their special charge with the working classes the special danger to be contended against is their tendency to abuse their strength and to resort to force for the attainment of their objects instead of persuasion but this danger is after all less than that of the misuse of intellectual power to which philosophers are so liable thinkers who try to make reasoning do the work of feeling can very seldom be convinced of their error popular excitement on the contrary has often yielded to feminine influence exerted though it has been hitherto without any systematic guidance the difference is no doubt partly owing to the fact that there are now few or none who deserve the name of philosophers for we cannot give that name to the superficial sophists and rhetoricians of our time whether psychologists or ideologists men wholly incapable of deep thought on any subject independently of this however the difference is explained by the character of the two classes women will always find it harder to deal with intellectual pride than with popular violence appeals to social feeling are their only weapons and social feelings of the workmen are stronger than those of the philosopher sophistry is far more formidable to them than passion in fact were it not that the working classes are even now so amenable to female influence society would be in extreme danger from the disorder caused by intellectual anarchy there are many sophisms which maintain themselves in spite of scientific refutation and which would be destructive of all order were it not for our moral instincts of this the communists offer a striking example in avoiding with that admirable inconsistency to which i have already called attention the extension of their principle to the family surrounded by the wildest theories such as if they were put in practice would utterly destroy or paralyze society we see large numbers of working men show in their daily life a degree of affection and respect for women which is unequalled by any other class it is well to reflect on facts like these not only because they lead us to judge the communist school with more justice but because occurring as they do in the midst of social anarchy they show what powerful agencies for good will be at our disposal in more settled times certainly they cannot be attributed to theological teaching which has rather had the effect of strengthening the errors which it attacks by the absurdity of its refutations they are simply the result of the influence which women have spontaneously exercised on the nobler feelings of the people in protestant countries where their influence is less the mischievous effects of communistic theories have been far greater we owe it to women that the family has been so little injured by the retrograde spirit of these republican reformers whose ideal of modern society is to absorb the family into the state as was done by a few small tribes in ancient greece the readiness shown by women in applying practical remedies to erroneous theories of morality is shown in other cases where the attractiveness of the air would seem irresistible to the coarser nature of men the evils consequent on divorce which has been authorized in germany for three centuries have been much lessened by women's instinctive repugnance to it 
the same may be said of recent attacks upon marriage which are still more serious because the anarchy of modern life revives all the extravagances of the metaphysical spirit in ancient times in no one case has a scheme of society hostile to marriage met with any real favor from women plausible as many of them seemed unable in their ignorance of social science to see the fallacy of such schemes themselves our revolutionary writers cannot conceive that women will not be convinced by them but happily women like the people judge in these matters by the heart rather than by the head in the absence of any guiding principle to direct an understanding and prevent the deviations to which it is always exposed the heart is a far safer guide there is no need at present of pursuing these remarks farther it is abundantly clear that women are in every respect adapted for rectifying the moral deviations to which every element of the social organism is liable and if we already feel the value of their influence springing as it does from the unaided inspirations of the heart we may be sure it will become far more consolidated and will be far more widely felt when it rests on the basis of a sound philosophical system capable of refuting sophisms and exposing fallacies from which their unassisted instinct is insufficient to preserve us thus the part to be played by women in public life is not merely passive not only will they give their sanction individually and collectively to the verdicts of public opinion as formed by philosophers and by the people but they will themselves interfere actively in moral questions it will be their part to maintain the primary principle of positivism which originated with themselves and of which they will always be the most natural representatives but how it may be asked can this be reconciled with my previous remark that women's life should still be essentially domestic for the ancients and for the greater part of the human race at the present time it would be irreconcilable but in western europe the solution has long ago been found for the time when women acquired as they did in the middle ages a fair measure of domestic freedom opportunities for social intercourse arose which combined most happily the advantages of private and of public life and in these women presided the practice afterward extended especially in france and these meetings became the laboratories of public opinion it seems now as if they had died out or had lost their character the intellectual and moral anarchy of our times is most unfavorable to free interchange of thoughts and feelings but a custom so social and which did such good service in the philosophical movement preceding the revolution is assuredly not destined to perish in the most perfect social state to which we are tending it will be developed more fully than ever when men's minds and hearts have accepted the rallying point offered by the new philosophy this is then the mode in which women can with propriety participate in public life here all classes will recognize their authority as paramount under the new system these meetings will entirely lose their old aristocratic character which is now simply obstructive the positivist salon will compel the series of social meetings in which the three elements of the spiritual power will be able to act in concert first there is the religious assemblage in the temple of humanity here the philosopher will naturally preside the other two classes taking on a secondary part in the club again it is the people who will take the active part women and philosophers will support them by their presence but without joining in the debate lastly women in their salons will promote active and friendly intercourse between all three classes here all who may be qualified to take a leading part will find their influence cordially accepted gently and without effort a moral control will thus be established by which act of violence or folly may be checked in their source 
kind advice given indirectly but earnestly will often save the philosopher from being blinded by ambition or from deviating through intellectual pride into useless digressions working men at these meetings will learn to repress the spirit of violence or envy that frequently arises in them recognizing the sacredness of the care thus manifested for their interests and the great and the wealthy will be taught from the manner in which praise and blame is given by those whose opinion is most valued that the only justifiable use of power or talent is to devote it to the service of the weak but however important the public duties that women will ultimately be called upon to perform the family is after all their highest and most distinctive sphere of work it was in allusion to their domestic influence that i spoke of them as the originators of spiritual power now the family although it is the basis of all human society has never been satisfactorily defended by any received system of society all the corrosive power of metaphysical analysis has been employed upon it and of many of the sophisms put forward no rational refutation has been given on the other hand the protection of the theologians is no less injurious for they still persist in connecting the institutions of the family with their obsolete dogmas which however useful they may have been formerly they are now simply dangerous from the close of the middle ages the priesthood has been powerless as the licentious songs of the troubadours prove to protect the sanctity of marriage against the shallow but mischievous attacks which even then were made against it and afterwards when their false principles became more generally prevalent and even royal courts disgraced themselves by giving public approval to them the weaknesses of the priests became still more manifest thus nothing can be more monstrous than these ignorant assertions that theological doctrines have been the safeguard of the family they have done nothing to preserve it from the most subversive attacks under which it must have succumbed but for the better instincts of society especially of the female portion of it with the exception of a foolish fiction about the origin of woman theology has put forward no systematic defence of marriage and as soon as theological authority itself fell into discredit the feeble sanction which it gave to domestic morality became utterly powerless against sophistical attacks but now that the family can be shown on positive principles to rest on scientific laws of human nature or of society the danger of metaphysical controversy and theological feebleness is past these principles will be discussed systematically in the second volume of the larger treatise to which this work is the introduction but the few remarks to which i must at present limit myself will i hope at least satisfy the reader as to the capability of positivism to re-establish morality upon a firm basis according to the lower views of the subject such as those coarsely expressed by the great hero of reaction napoleon procreation and maternity are the only social functions of women indeed many theorists object even to her rearing her children and think it preferable to leave them to the abstract benevolence of the state but in the positivist theory of marriage the principal function of woman is one quite unconnected with procreation it is a function dependent on the highest attributes of our nature vast as is the moral importance of maternity yet the position of wife has always been considered even more characteristic of woman's nature as shown by the fact that the words woman and wife are in many languages synonymous marriage is not always followed by children and besides this a bad wife is very seldom indeed a good mother the first aspect then under which positivism considers woman is simply as the companion of man irrespective of her maternal duties viewed thus marriage is the most elementary and yet the most perfect mode of social life it is the only association in which entire identity of interests is possible in this union to the moral completeness of which the language of all civilized nations bears testimony 
the noblest aim of human life is realized as far as it ever can be for the object of human existence as shown in the second chapter is progress of every kind progress in morality that is to say in the subjection of self-interest to social feeling holding the first rank now this unquestionable principle leads us by a very sure and direct path to the true theory of marriage different as the two sexes are by nature and increased as that difference is by the diversity which happily exists in their social position each is consequently necessary to the moral development of the other in practical energy and in the mental capacity which usually accompanies it man is evidently superior to woman woman's strength on the other hand lies in feeling she excels man in love as man excels her in force it is impossible to conceive of a closer union than that which binds these two beings to the mutual service and perfection of each other saving them from all danger of rivalry the voluntary character too of this union gives it a still further charm when the choice has been on both sides a happy one in the positive theory then of marriage its principal object is considered to be that of completing and confirming the education of the heart by calling out the purest and strongest of human sympathies it is true that sexual instinct which in man's case at all events was the origin of conjugal attachment is a feeling purely selfish it is also true that its absence would in the majority of cases diminish the energy of affection but woman with her more loving heart has usually far less need of this coarse stimulus than man the influence of her purity reacts on man and ennobles his affection the affection is in itself so sweet that when once it has been aroused by whatever agency its own charm is sufficient to maintain it in activity when this is the case conjugal union becomes a perfect ideal of friendship yet still more beautiful than friendship because each possesses and is possessed by the other for perfect friendship difference of sex is essential as excluding the possibility of rivalry no other voluntary tie can admit of such full and unrestrained confidence it is the source of the most unalloyed happiness that man can enjoy for there can be no greater happiness than to live for another but independently of the intrinsic nature of this sacred union we have to consider its importance from the social point of view it is the first stage in our progress towards that which is the final object of moral education namely universal love many writers of the so-called socialist school look upon conjugal love and universal benevolence the two extreme terms in the scale of affections as opposed to each other in the second chapter i pointed out the falseness and danger of this view the man who is incapable of deep affection for one whom he has chosen as his partner in the most intimate relations of life can hardly expect to be believed when he professes devotion to a mass of human beings of whom he knows nothing the heart cannot throw off its original selfishness without the aid of some complete and enduring affection the conjugal love concentrated as it is upon one object exclusively is more enduring and complete than any other from personal experience of strong love we arise by degrees to sincere affection for all mankind although as the scope of feeling widens its energy must decrease the connection of these two states of feeling is instinctively recognized by all and it is clearly indicated by the positive theory of human nature which has now placed it beyond the reach of metaphysical attacks when the moral empire of woman has been more firmly established by the diffusion of positivist principles men will see that the common practice of looking at the private life of a statesman as the best guarantee of his public conduct had deep wisdom in it one of the strongest symptoms of the general laxity of morals to which mental anarchy has brought us is that disgraceful law passed in france thirty years ago and yet not repealed 
the avowed object of which was to surround men's lives with a wall of privacy a law introduced by psychologist politicians who no doubt needed such a wall the purpose of marriage once clearly understood it becomes easy to define its conditions the intervention of society is necessary but its only object is to confirm and to develop the order of things which exists naturally it is essential in the first place to the high purposes for which marriage has been instituted that the union shall be both exclusive and indissoluble so essential indeed are both conditions that we frequently find them even when the connection is illegal that any one should have ventured to propound the doctrine that human happiness is to be secured by levity and inconsistency in love is a fact which nothing but the utter deficiency of social and moral principles can explain love cannot be deep unless it remains constant to a fixed object the very possibility of change is a temptation to it so differently constituted as men and women are is their short life too much for perfect knowledge and love of one another yet the versatility to which most human affection is liable makes the intervention of society necessary without some check upon indecision and caprice life might degenerate into a miserable series of experiments each ending in failure and degradation sexual love may become a powerful engine for good but only on the condition of placing it under rigorous and permanent discipline those who doubt the necessity for this have only to cast a glance beyond western europe at the countries where no such discipline has been established it has been said that the adoption or rejection of monogamy is a simple question of climate but for this hypothesis there is no ground whatever it is as contrary to common observation as to philosophic theory marriage like every other human institution has always been improving beginning in all countries with unrestricted polygamy it tends in all to the purest monogamy tracing back the history of northern europe we find polygamy there as well as in the south and southern nations like northern adopt polygamy as their social life advances we see the tendency to it in those parts of the east which come into contact with western civilization monogamy then is one of the most precious gifts which the middle ages have bequeathed to western europe the striking superiority of social life in the west is probably due to it more than to any other cause protestant countries have seriously impaired its value by their laws of divorce but this aberration will hardly be permanent it is alien to the purer feelings of women and of the people and the mischief done by it is limited to the privileged classes france is now threatened with a revival of the metaphysical delusions of the revolution and it is feared by some that the disastrous example of germany in this respect will be imitated but all such tendencies being utterly inconsistent with the habits of modern life will soon be checked by the sounder philosophical principles which have now arisen the mode of resistance to these errors which positivism adopts will render the struggle most useful in hastening the adoption of the true theory of marriage the spirit of positivism being always relative concessions may be made to meet exceptional cases without weakening or contradicting the principle whereas the absolute character of theological doctrine was incompatible with concession the rules of morality should be general and comprehensive but in their practical application exceptions have often to be made by no philosophy but the positive can these two conditions be reconciled to the spirit of anarchy however positivism yields nothing the unity essential to marriage it renders more complete than ever it develops the principles of monogamy by inculcating not as a legal institution but as moral duty the perpetuity of widowhood affection so firmly concentrated has always been regarded with respect even on man's side 
but hitherto no religion has had sufficient purity or influence to secure its adoption positivism however from the completeness of its synthesis and from the fact that its rules are invariably based on the laws of nature will gain such influence and we find little difficulty in inducing all natures of delicate feeling to accept this additional obligation it follows from the very principle which to the positivist is the object of all marriage the raising and the purifying of the heart unity of the tie which is already recognized as necessary in life is not less so in death constancy in widowhood was once common among women and if its moral beauty is less appreciated now it is because all systematic morality has been forgotten but it is none the less as careful study of human nature will show a most precious source of moral good and one which is not beyond the reach of nobler natures even in their youth voluntary widowhood while it offers all the advantages which chastity can confer on the intellectual and physical as well as on the moral nature is yet free from the moral dangers of celibacy constant adoration of one whom death has implanted more visibly and deeply on the memory leads all high natures and especially philosophers to give themselves more unreservedly to the service of humanity and thus their public life is animated by the ennobling influence of their innermost feelings alike from a sense of their own truest happiness and from devotion to public duty they will be led to this result deep as is the satisfaction in this prolongation of the sacredness of marriage it may be carried by those who recognize its value yet further as the death of one did not destroy the bond so neither should the death of both let then those whom death could not divide be laid in the same grave together a promise of this solemn act of perpetuation might be given beforehand when the organs of public opinion judged it merited a man would find a new motive for public exertion if it were felt to be a pledge that the memory of her whom he loved should be forever coupled with his own we have a few instances where this union of memory has taken place spontaneously as in the case of laura and petrarch and of dante and beatrice yet these instances are so exceptional that they hardly help us to realize the full value of the institution proposed there is no reason for limiting it to cases of extraordinary genius in the more healthy state of society to which we are tending where private and public life will be far more closely connected than they have been hitherto this recompense of service may be given to all who have deserved it by those who have come within their circle of influence such then are the consolations which positivist sympathy can give they leave no cause to regret the visionary hopes held out by christianity hopes which now are as enfeebling to the heart as to the intellect here as in all other respects the moral superiority of positivism is shown for the comfort which it gives to the bereaved implies a strengthening of the tie christian consolation of which so much has been said rather encourages a second union by so doing it seriously impairs the value of the institution for a division of affection arises which indeed seems hardly compatible with the vague utopia of a future life the institutions of perpetual widowhood and of union in the tomb have found no place in any previous system though both were wanting to make monogamy complete here as elsewhere the best reply which the new philosophy can give to ignorant prejudice or malignant calumny is to take new steps forward in the moral advancement of man. End of section 18。section 19 of a general view of positivism。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。a general view of positivism 
by Auguste Comte, translated by John Henry Bridges. Section 19. Chapter 4. The Influence of Positivism Upon Women. Part 4. Thus the theory of marriage as set forward by the positivist becomes totally independent of any physical motive. It is regarded by him as the most powerful instrument of moral education, and therefore as the basis of public or individual welfare. It is no overstrained enthusiasm which leads us to elevate the moral purity of marriage. We do so from rigorous examination of the facts of human nature all the best results whether personal or social of marrying may follow when the union though more impassioned is as chaste as that of brother and sister the sexual instinct has no doubt something to do in most cases with the first formation of the passion but it is not necessary in all cases to gratify the instinct abstinence in cases where there is real ground for it on both sides will but serve to strengthen mutual affection we have examined the position of woman as a wife without supposing her to be a mother we shall find that maternity while it extends her sphere of moral influence does not alter its nature as a mother no less than as a wife her position will be improved by positivism she will have almost exclusively the direction of the household education public education given subsequently will be little but a systematic development of that which has been previously given at home for it is a fundamental principle that education in the normal condition of society must be entrusted to the spiritual power and in the family the spiritual power is represented by woman there are strong prejudices against entrusting the education of children to mothers prejudices springing from the revolutionary spirit of modern times since the close of the middle ages the tendency has been to place the intellect above the heart we have neglected the moral side of education and i have given undue importance to the intellectual side but positivism having superseded this revolutionary phase by demonstrating the preponderance of the heart over the intellect moral education will assume its proper place certainly the present mode of instruction is not adopted for woman's teaching but their influence over the education of the family will be greater than it was in the middle ages for in the first place in every part of it moral considerations will be paramount and moreover until puberty nothing will be studied continuously except art and poetry the knights of old times were usually brought up in this way under feminine guidance and on them most assuredly it had no enervating influence the training can hardly be supposed less adapted to a pacific than to a warlike state of society for instruction theoretical and practical as distinguished from education masters are no doubt necessary but moral education will be left entirely to women until the time arrives for systematic teaching of moral science in the years immediately preceding majority here the philosopher is necessary but the chief duties of the philosopher lie with adults his aim being to recall them individually or collectively to principles impressed on them in childhood and to enforce the right application of those principles to special cases as they may arise that part of education which has the greatest influence on life what may be called the spontaneous training of the feelings belongs entirely to the mother hence it is as i have already observed of the greatest importance to allow the pupil to remain with his family and to do away with the monastic seclusion of our public schools the peculiar fitness of women for inculcating these elementary principles of morality is a truth which every true philosopher will fully recognize women having stronger sympathies than men must be better able to call out sympathies than others men of good sense have always felt it more important to train the heart than the head and this is the view adopted by positive philosophy 
there is a danger of exaggerating the importance of system and of forgetting the conditions on which its utility depends but the positivist is preserved from this danger by the peculiar reality of his philosophy in morals even more than in other subjects we can only systematize what has existed previously without system the feelings must first be stimulated to free and direct action before we attempt to bring them under philosophic discipline and this process which begins with birth and lasts during the whole period of physical growth shall be left for women to superintend so specially are they adapted for it that failing a mother a female friend if well chosen and if she can make herself sufficiently a member of the family will in most cases do better than the father himself the importance of the subject can only be appreciated by minds dominated as women's minds are by feeling women can see what men can seldom see that most actions and certainly the actions of youth and childhood ought not to be judged in themselves so much as by the tendencies which they show or by the habits to which they lead viewed with reference of their influence on character no actions are indifferent the simplest events in a child's life may serve as an occasion for enforcing the fundamental principle by which the early as well as later stages of positivist education should be directed the strengthening of social feeling the weakening of self-love in fact actions of an unimportant kind are precisely those in which it is easiest to appreciate the feelings which prompted them since the mind of the observer not being occupied with the consequences of such actions is more free to examine their source moreover it is only by teaching the child to do right in small things that he can be trained for the hard inward struggle that lies before him in life the struggle to bring selfish instincts more and more completely under the control of his higher sympathies in these respects the best tutor however sympathetic his nature will be always far inferior to a good mother a mother may often not be able to explain the reason of the principle on which she acts but the wisdom of her plans will generally show itself in the end without formal teaching she will take every opportunity of showing her children as no other instructor could show them the joy that springs from generous feelings and the misery of yielding to selfishness from the relation of mother we return by a natural transition to woman's position as a wife the mother though her authority of course tends to decrease continues to superintend the growth of character until the ordinary age of marriage up to that time feminine influence over man has been involuntary on his part by marriage he enters into a voluntary engagement of subordination to woman for the rest of his life thus he completes his moral education destined himself for action he finds his highest happiness in honorable submission to one in whom the dominant principle is affection positivism holds out to woman a most important sphere of public and private duty this sphere as we may now see is nothing but a larger and more systematic development of the qualities by which she is characterized her mission is so uniform in its nature and so clearly defined that there seems hardly room for much uncertainty as to her proper social position it is a striking instance of the rule which applies universally to all human effort namely that the order of things instituted by man ought to be simply a consolidation and improvement of the natural order in all ages of transition as in our own there have been false and sophistical views of the social position of women but we find it to be a natural law that woman should pass the greater part of her life in the family and this law has never been affected to any important extent it has always been accepted instinctively though the sophistical arguments against it have never yet been adequately refuted 
the institution of the family has survived the subtle attacks of greek metaphysicians which then were in all the vigor of their youth and which were acting on minds that had no systematic principle to oppose them therefore profound as the intellectual anarchy of the present day may be we need not be seriously alarmed when we see that nothing worse comes of it than shallow plagiarisms from ancient utopias against which the vigorous satire of aristophanes was quite enough to arouse general indignation true there is a more complete absence of social principles now than when the world was passing from polytheism to monotheism but our intellectual powers are more developed than they were then and in moral culture our superiority is even greater women in those times were too degraded to offer even the opposition of their silence to the pedants who professed to be taking up their cause the only resistance offered was of a purely intellectual kind but happily in modern times the women of the west have been free and have consequently been able to manifest such unmistakable aversion for these ideas and for the want of moral discipline which gives rise to them that though still unrefuted philosophically their mischievous effects have been neutralized nothing but women's antipathy has prevented the practical outrages which seem logically to follow from these subversive principles among our privileged classes the danger is aggravated by indolence moreover the possession of wealth has a bad influence on women's moral nature yet even here the evil is not really very deep or widely spread men have never been seriously perverted and women still less so by flattery of their bad propensities the really formidable temptations are those which act upon our better instincts and give them a wrong direction schemes which are utterly offensive to female delicacy will never really be adopted even by the wealthier classes who are less averse to them than others the repugnance shown to them by the people with whom the mischief that they would cause would be irreparable is far more decided the life which working people lead makes it very clear to both sexes what the proper position of each should be thus it will be in the very class where the preservation of the institution of the family is of the greatest importance that positivists will find the least difficulty in establishing their theory of the social position of women as consequent on the sphere of public and private duty which has been here assigned to them looking at the relation of this theory to other parts of the positive system we shall see that it follows from the great principle which dominates every other social problem the principle of separating spiritual and temporal power that woman's life should be concentrated in her family and that even there her influence should be that of persuasion rather than that of command is but an extension of the principle which excludes the spiritual power from political administration women as the purest and most spontaneous of the moral forces of society are bound to fulfil with rigorous exactness all the conditions which the exercise of moral force demands effectually to perform their mission of the controlling and guiding our affections they must abstain altogether from the practical pursuits of the stronger sex such abstinence even when the arrangement of society may leave it optional is still more desirable in their case than in the case of philosophers active life incompatible as it is with the clearness and breadth of philosophic speculation is even more injurious to delicacy of feeling which is women's highest claim to our respect and the true secret of their influence the philosophic spirit is incompatible with a position of practical authority because such a position occupies the mind with questions of detail but to purity of feeling it is even more dangerous because it strengthens the instincts of power and of gain and for women it would be harder to avoid the danger of such a position than for men abounding as they do in sympathy they are generally deficient in energy and are therefore less able to withstand corrupting influences 
the more we examine this important subject the clearer it becomes that the present condition of women does not hamper them in the true work that on the contrary it is well calculated to develop and even improve their highest qualities the natural arrangements of society in this as in other respects are far less faulty than certain blind disclaimers would have us believe but for the existence of strong material forces moral force would soon deteriorate because its distinctive purpose would be gone philosophers and proletaries would soon lose their intellectual and moral superiority by the acquisition of power on women its effect would be still more disastrous for instance in the upper classes of society where wealth gives them independence and sometimes unfortunately even power we see but too clearly what the consequences would be and this is why we have to look to the poorer classes for the highest type of womanly perfection with the people sympathy is better cultivated and has a greater influence upon life wealth has more to do with the moral degradation of women among the privileged classes than even idleness and dissipation progress in this respect as in every other is only a more complete development of the pre-existing order equality in the position of the two sexes is contrary to their nature and no tendency to it has at any time been exhibited all history assures us that with the growth of society the peculiar features of each sex have become not less but more distinct by catholic feudalism the social condition of women in western europe was raised to a far higher level but it took away from them the priestly functions which they had held under polytheism a religion in which the priesthood was more occupied with art than with science so too with the gradual decline of the principle of caste women have been excluded more and more rigidly from royalty and from every other kind of political authority again there is a visible tendency towards the removal of women from all industrial occupations even from those which might seem best suited to them and thus female life instead of becoming independent of the family is being more and more concentrated in it while at the same time their proper sphere of moral influence is constantly extending the two tendencies so far from being opposed are inseparably connected without discussing the absurd and retrograde schemes which have been recently put forward on the subject there is one remark which may serve to illustrate the value of the order which now exists if women were to obtain that equality in the affairs of life which their so-called champions are claiming for them without their wish not only would they suffer morally but their social position would be endangered they would be subject in almost every occupation to a degree of competition which they would not be able to sustain moreover by the rivalry in the pursuits of life mutual affection between the sexes would be corrupted at its source leaving these subversive dreams we find a natural principle which by determining the practical obligations of the active to the sympathetic sex averts this danger it is a principle which no philosophy but positivism has been sufficiently real and practical to bring forward systematically for general acceptance it is no new invention however but a universal tendency confirmed by careful study of the whole past history of man the principle is that man should provide for woman it is a natural law of the human race a law connected with the essentially domestic character of female life we find it in the rudest forms of social life and with every step in the progress of society its adoption becomes more extensive and complete a still larger application of this fundamental principle will meet all the material difficulties under which women are now laboring all social relations and especially the question of wages will be affected by it the tendency to it is spontaneous but it also follows from the high position which positivism has assigned to woman 
as the sympathetic element in the spiritual power the intellectual class in the same way has to be supported by the practical class in order to have its whole time available for the special duties imposed upon it but in the case of women the obligation of the other sex is still more sacred because the sphere of duty in which protection of them is required is the home the obligation to provide for the intellectual class affects society as a whole but the maintenance of women is with few exceptions a personal obligation each individual should consider himself bound to maintain the woman he has chosen to be his partner in life there are cases however in which men should be considered collectively responsible for the support of the other sex women who are without husband or parents should have their maintenance guaranteed by society and this not merely from compassion for their dependent position but with the view of enabling them to render public service of the greatest moral value the direction then of progress in the social condition of woman is this to render her life more and more domestic to diminish as far as possible the burden of outdoor labor and so to fit her more completely for her special office of educating our moral nature among the privileged classes it is already a recognized rule that women should be spared all laborious exertion it is the one point in the relations of the sexes in which the working classes would do well to imitate the habits of their employers in every other respect the people of western europe have a higher sense of their duties to women than the upper classes indeed there are few of them who would not be ashamed of the barbarity of subjecting women to their present burdensome occupations if the present state of our industrial system allowed of its abolition but it is chiefly among the higher and wealthier classes that we find those degrading and very often fraudulent bargains connected with unscrupulous interference of parents in the question of marriage which are so humiliating to one sex and so corrupting to the other among the working classes the practice of giving dowries is almost extinct and as women's true mission becomes more recognized and as choice in marriage becomes less restricted this relic of barbarism with all its debasing results will rapidly die out with this view the application of our theory should be carried one step further women should not be allowed to inherit if inheritance be allowed the prohibition of dowries would be evaded in a very obvious manner by discounting the reversionary interest since women are to be exempt from the labor of production capital that is to say the instrument of labor produced by each generation for the benefit of the next should revert to men this view of inheritance so far from making men a privileged class places them under heavy responsibilities it is not from women that any serious opposition to it will proceed wise education will show them its value to themselves personally as a safeguard against unworthy suitors but important as the rule is it should not be legally enforced until it has become established on its own merits as a general custom which every one has felt to conduce to the healthy organization of the family as here described end of section nineteen